Yes, thank you, and uh, uh, pleasure to be back here uh, after a two-year hiatus with COVID. And uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm quite honored. Great to be in Wellington, which is you know, very much like Kobe, where I now live, um, with the mountains and water and the civilization in between, okay. and the nice civilization in between, not the not the bad one. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, so the talk will be reverting back to uh, sort of a big iron, um, you know, big systems, not systems, the systems of it, big systems, right? <laughs> and um, and uh, so uh, we built this machine for Gaku, as you may know. And um, we are, and it's been what? When we started, like 12 years now uh, from our unofficial start. And um, now, of course, the machine is chugging along fine and producing great results, and we are uh, looking at the next system, Fugaku Next, which we hope to deploy in several years. Uh, of course, we're doing lots of research, um, you know, being a scientist. And uh, in the meantime, you know, being a scientist and also engineer at the same time, we're looking at various uh, research and, you know, saying, uh, what the hell is this? And, uh, and uh, why, 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 why on earth can anybody say a uh, hype like this? And so we are set on a mission. We got set on a mission to uh, study our next generation system and encountered all these myths and try to either debunk them or really you know, find out that the, the myth may be true. So, so anyhow, so that's the synopsis of the talk. And the first, for the first five minutes, I'll go very, I'll go very quickly over Fugaku because many of you may already know, but some of you may not know. So I'll do a very quick overview of Fugaku and its present. So Fugaku, uh, so what we did was to build this, uh, uh, as a, at the core is this new ARM chip we have built back in, it was first booted Linux in 2018, uh, May of 2018. It was the first server CPU to be fabricated with seven nanometer process. The B0, the commercial version, was introduced in 2019. Has 48 ARM cores. You know, with our own microarchitecture, we didn't get um, the core IP is not ARM. A lot of people mistake that. Uh, you know, we took the ARM score and put it in. No, uh, uh, like like what uh, uh, many companies do, but no, we didn't do that. We built our own microarchitecture. So it has, um, you know. A decent performance uh, that you know, kind of comparable to like Xeon, but uh, one terabyte per second memory bandwidth, which is several times Xeon, because uh, we used HBM2 for the first time uh, for general purpose CPU, which was not replicated until uh, Intel came out recently with the uh, software Rapids with HBM, quite recently, so after four years. Right? And, um, and the uh, chip is very power efficient, provably power, uh, very power efficient, as you will see. Has a mainframe grade resiliency. Um, Fujitsu is very, uh, very good at that. So the, so the system has scaled to over 100,000 of these chips and runs very stable. And um, it's ARM v8.2 ISA compliant, which means that um, you know, it boosts RHEL out of the box, um, but also has the SVE extensions. Also, on the right-hand side corner, you, uh, I'm sorry, the left-hand side corner has an embedded um, network switch and uh, not, not just a network interface, but you see on the, sorry, I got the pointer. We're here, Tohu D. That's our uh, network uh, switch embedded in the chip. So each chip is capable, uh, has a 10-port switch which gives a, an a interface which gives us 400 gigabit class uh, network performance per chip. And the uh, point to point latency between the chips is below 0.5 microsecond. So, uh, and because every node has, every chip and node as and such a node has a, has a switch, it has 160,000 chip, and the system has 160,000 nodes, it has 160,000 switches. And each switch is 10 ports, so it's 1.6 million network ports. So it's a very large system. But uh, in order to do this, we had to design a system where uh, the network only uses less than 10% of the overall budget. So the network operates at uh, 8 to 9 watts, including the AOC. And if you work a network, this is significant. And we get about 6 petabytes per second of injection bandwidth. 
and um, and it's well, very scalable, and, and we put some disaggregation feature, but I won't go into that. In production, as you'll see, uh, we use only about 100 watts per node, which is one third to one fourth of a comparable Xeon, Xeon server, okay? So then, you know, you can read all these after, that's, you know, that's like a, uh, uh, at a glance kind of chip then. No, we provide about 1.3 billion node hours uh, of uh, cycle to the researchers worldwide, poor Japan, but also elsewhere, about 60 billion CPU core hours per year. And uh, you no, know, you can apply too. Um, for it's it's open to if you're academic, it's open for um, it's open for um, uh, you, know, you know the call is open for you to use. And it's been like number one in you know most many most benchmarks. We've been you know so we've been super C and um, but the, being number one in the benchmark is not the Objective, uh, the real objective of the project was to excel in many of these uh, uh, application areas. Can you go back? Yeah. You have, where's my phone? You have some of your disks. One of the users, it is Australia and NCI. Yeah, we just, we just signed a MOU with NCI. Yes. May I ask what for? Um, to, uh, to work on, um, you know, various, uh, like, Various future supercomputing projects. Yes. We signed it like last week. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, of course, the real objectives is not to be number one in various benchmarks. Uh, it's the application. The application first is uh, exascale. Applications first was our philosophy. So the objective was to be a hundred times fast, about a uh, hundred times faster than the K computer, the predecessor, in important application areas for sustainability, such as health medicine, environment disaster, energy or you know, carbon neutrality, materials, manufacturing, and of course, basic sciences. And over, there were target applications we had set. And uh, on the average, we're about factor 70 faster than a K computer. So we achieved our goals. And uh, for some of the apps, we were more than 100 times faster, like Genesis, which is a molecular dynamics, Ensemble and 127, which is a weather forecast um, and all data simulation application. So, you know, so we won. Uh, so, Fugaku uh, was involved in two Gordon Bell Prizes for two consecutive years. It was number one in various benchmarks, like I told you. And uh, we have um, supplied technologies to Tokyo Olympics for the weather forecast, and also we're all working with the uh, 2025 Osaka Expo people to provide. No, our technology's there, but we're working with many people, okay? And uh, we got uh, seven, uh, seven thousand, several thousand users, and uh, six, uh, one characteristic of Fugaku is that about 60% of all the Fugaku projects involve some users, industrial users. So they may be, so the research may be still fairly exploratory, um, but s some are very industrial, but some research may be exploratory, but they typically include industrial partners from day one. That's because, you know, so industry really sees the utility of the projects that are being, you know, that are being conducted on Fugaku. With risk with power, so there was, you know, uh, everybody's ex experiencing power crisis due to, you know, the situation in Ukraine. And um, so we were hit with that. So we had to really um, work harder. We were already very power efficient, but really had to work really, really harder to turn on all the power saving features uh, of our, uh, that was present on Fugaku, but we didn't turn on for, uh, pr um, for some of the stability reasons, but we went and uh, turned them on. So right now, so I won't go into, again, to details, uh, Fugaku has several power modes that allows user, that allows user selection of these power modes. So we ask the users to be really conservative with their power while not sacrificing their runtime, because if they, sacrifice the runtime, that is the time to solution, that's bad for throughput, but also and bad for energy, overall energy to solution. So we ask users to make sure they have, you know, the same runtime as they had, but set it to the power mode that saves the most power or uses the least energy. And, uh, you know, users get back, and when they run job executes, they get the, you know, energy profile back, so they, you know, they pick and they do benchmarks on their own. They pick and choose. 
So with all of that, we were able to reduce the average power consumption to about 100 watts per node, which, like I said, if you, um, no, uh, for HPC purposes, the equivalent Xeon server wouldn't like, like 400 watts. So we're using, uh, so, you know, Fugaku, if we built out those Xeons, it would have been like, you know, instead of being 60 megawatts, it would have been like 60 megawatts. So we wouldn't have been able to afford that bill. So, uh, and, you know, so it's one of the uh, most power efficient production machine in the world. So you may ask, well, there are, what about metrics like Green Fund 500? Well, a metric like that is not useful because it's based on LIMPAC, which is not a useful metric in the first place. Uh, I allude to Green 500 is like measuring, uh, although, you know, I've been, I have machines ranked number one for several times in the past. Green 500 is not, is like, you know, measuring your car's miles per gallon fuel of fuel efficiency by stepping on the gas pedal all the way to the bottom and saying that's your MPG, okay? So that's not a very credible metric. So it's really the, uh, it's the power consumption in real usage that matters, right? So you can get the status of real-time update. We have a dashboard, which is public. So if you Google like Fugaku status, you can get real-time and you can you know, get like a whole you know, year's worth of statistic because it's all, uh, you can be displayed in the dashboard you'll see that, uh, you know, the various power modes and you know, how many nodes are available. Typically, we have about 160, all of 160,000 nodes in operation. So you can see the machine in action. And um, so if you compare it to another fine system, Frontier, you know, there are various metrics. Um, you know, some, some, some metrics, Frontier is better. Of course, it's a newer machine. And some, machine, uh, some metrics, Fugaku, uh, still is better. So, but all in all, I think these two are uh, fine machines. And, uh, you know, they're, you know, so HPE and AMD and, uh, of course, so Cridge did a great job in building, you know, in some, in some metrics, the fastest machines or in some metrics, number two uh, following Fugaku. But, you know, again, these two machines are sort of comparable side by side. So uh, it's very likely that the two machines will be very matched in production, right? So, like... And because, for example, Fugaku has higher memory bandwidth, so it'll probably be better in, in memory bound applications, but you know, Frontier has uh, higher impact scores, so, so some benchmark, so for some applications, it'll be better. That said, if you try to do the, um, uh, if you try to, you know, but you know, moving forward, what's important will be the power, um, power efficiency of these machines, because like I said, we cannot afford any, to use much more power. We're already using, you know, you know, 60 megawatts on average. We include, if we include cooling, it'll bump up to 20 megawatts uh, in the, on the average, and that's a lot of money. Um, we pay, you know, millions, you know, tens of millions of dollars of electricity bill, and also, so it's not a sustainable gesture to say we'll be using 100 megawatts for the next next generation machines. So then, if we assume that Frontier and Fugaku are well matched, and we and uh, we'll be in in collaboration with DOE to confirm that, because a lot of DOE codes now run on Fugaku, and, uh, and we'll also be doing comparative analysis of our codes and DOE codes on Frontier as well to see you know, how they match up. But you know, we, the expectation is that they will be, like I said, pretty similar, and also the, some of the numbers we're seeing from the power consumption numbers of, of uh, Frontier seems to indicate that the power consumption numbers are, will be fairly similar, okay? And if you look at the GPU numbers and so forth, they, that backs up the assumption. But that means we have made, so that's good news, but the bad news is that means we made no progress in the past three years, right? Now you can confirm that for the numbers. It's, while the GPUs may boast fantastic numbers, like in flops or bandwidth, they also, that also involves tremendously high power consumption, like several hundred watts. Remember, Fugak, AC for FX is 100 watts per node, right? So even if you have three terabytes of bandwidth, if the chip uses 400 watts, that's not, that's inferior compared to Fugak, which only uses 300 watts for this three terabyte per second, for, for three nodes, which will give you three terabytes per second of bandwidth. So it's really, you know, fl not floss per watt for real apps, also bandwidth per watt, whatever, that restricts your application's performance per energy, that will be the government equation. That will be the dominant parameter in your next systems. But again, we've made very little progress in the past three years. 
Okay, so that's the so that's the problem. So we've been studying many things to how to alleviate that for our next generation, but came up encountered many myths and what we consider as myth, and um, or maybe may not be. So, but we decided to write uh, a paper. Uh, you know, this is uh, Tor my good friend and collaborator Torsten Hoffler from the ETH Zurich. He was also a co awardee of one of the you know prizes at SC. I got the Gray Award. Um, Torsten got the uh, Fernbach Award. And also I had uh, you know, my young guns at the at, my, at the RCCS, uh, sort of the Skunk Works team, and also various people who I work with. Some people from Intel, some people from or Europe and other places. So, uh, so we wrote a paper. Uh, we just wrote a paper um, which was published. Uh, it's still in um, still on being under review. So the final version may be different, uh, maybe a little bit more updated. In fact, we're getting lots of feedbacks. And uh, if, but, it's, uh, but we advertise it a lot on Twitter, and I think a lot, a lot of people may have read it. If you're interested, please read it because it's a very light. It's a very light read, and we got very uh, positive responses from people. Uh, but basically, we try to what we try to do is to go over various topics and label them as myth. It was Christmas time when we were writing the paper and New Year, so we said like 12 myths in HPC and following a song. And um, and uh, try to see if they you know if if there are myths or if they contain any trace of truth or or are they like debatable topics. Okay. And um, so again, uh, you know, if you're interested, uh, I would recommend you read the paper. Uh, in in interest of time, I cannot cover all the topics. I uh, try to cover you know uh, about seven of them um, for the purpose of you know discussing what uh, how we should move forward. In designing the next uh, next generation system, um, uh, it's not to say that these are the most interesting. There are some things like you know, um, Fortran is dead, but I won't go into that because that typically turns into religious war. Okay, okay so we'll start with myth six, which which um, which says so, well, some companies have claimed we will soon run at X zeta scale. Okay, I won't name which company, but you know, some companies have publicly proclaimed that. In fact, one company we work with very closely, but so we're not blaming them. We're just we're just saying it's a fact if it's a fact that some people have claimed it. But you know, even if we work together, we may have differences in opinions. Or we may say we have to be more careful about what we proclaim. And the associated with this is the myth nine, which is applications will continue to improve even on stagnating hardware. Okay. So, so we did some analysis. Oh, I don't know what the. Oh, contains some company name which we shall ignore. <laughs> and um, so that's a projection made by a certain company. And then uh, this is uh, what we extrapolate from the past data. Uh, this is a figure from the paper. And uh, if the simple extrapolation says that we will even at the at the best case we will not be reaching exascale until 2038, and this is the best, uh, this is the best case. And of course, we can go, you know, I can spend hours uh, proclaiming even this is an optimistic estimation, estimate given the energy profile and how the semiconductor, you know, feature scaling will go and all that. But it, let's not get into those you know, details. Even, but this is saying even the best extrapolation will not allow us to get there, okay? Okay, but, what, but are we, is that what we worry about, reaching XL impact? Well, no, because that's not what we're, because that's no relevance to real applications. What Fugaku aimed for, if you remember, is to uh, achieve exascale performance on real applications. So the question is, can we reach sort of a, you know, a zeta, scale, uh, zeta scale performance on real applications in, let's say, uh, our next generation time frame, which will be like 2029, 20, 2030, okay? So can we get zeta scale performance by 2030 would be a big, uh, would be one of the big subject matter. So there's one work that was done on Fugaku. This is um, work done by a team at University of Tokyo and Enrique and Fujitsu, also a Jamstack, uh, led by Tsuyoshi Chimura, which, who's one of the most renowned uh, earthquake uh, scientists we have. And this got the best, pri uh, best, uh, best paper prize at uh, HPC Asia 2022. So, 
uh, in a nutshell, they try to do a very, very um, extensive high resolution and coupled earthquake simulation on Fugaku. So, but they estimated that in order to achieve the scientific results, they needed something like you know, a 10x, 10x scale machine to, to achieve the results. Uh, so this is like, you know, uh, this is like a dream, uh, this is to earthquake, to the earthquake simulation community, it's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, like a grant, like the grant, uh, uh, like the grant's prize or the, you know, uh, a grand scale target applications, grand challenge, I'm sorry, grand challenge application. So you have a fault, you have a uh, wave propagation and crust and bedrock and surface soil, you have city buildings, underground structures, so very holistic and high resolution uh, simulations involving all these structures under the ground and all the way up to the buildings and how they would collapse. And this will be very, very difficult. Uh, it will require, you know, even for, if you, the best algorithms, they said that the best algorithm that was previously developed on a K computer and also run on Summit and got the Gordon Bell, uh, was a Gordon Bell finalist back in 2018. If they used that best algorithm, it would have taken a 10x exaflop machine to, to execute. So what they did was to uh, come up with a new algorithm using uh, data, you know, combining, well, sort of AI, data-driven approach. Also, of course, um, from a raw hardware standpoint, uh, from K to Fugaku, we got about 40x uh, improvement at the raw hardware level. So combining their, I won't go into details, with details I advise you read the paper, so they got uh, 25x performance gain from the, um, from the new algorithm that was combining a data-driven approach and, of course, simulation results. And the important thing here is they got the exact same result. It's not like you know those uh, AI surrogate applications where they, you have questionable results, but they got provable, provably exact same results as they have, would have gotten had they computed this in a straightforward fashion using a 2018 algorithm, but ran a run a lot faster. So this was a thousand X speed up over, uh, over the K computer, which was a 10 petaflop machine. So this, so, so they effectively got a 10 exascale performance by combining this algorithm innovation and of course improvements in hardware. So, so, you know, what they solved was like 1.2 trillion degree of freedom problem uh, from a 19.2 trillion component data set uh, generated inside the simulation. So it's, it's a huge simulation nonetheless. So, um, but again, um, the important fact is they, were ma they managed to accelerate using a combined approach, but it got the exact same result numerically, okay? So if we extrapolate this to the next generation, if we can get 20x to 40x speed up compared to Hugaku, which is like you know, half, half, you know, half exaflop to exaflop performance. And we get 2x by ancillary advances like you know, mixed precision and so forth. And we get 25x like we had gotten here with the combining combination of physics and data and AI algorithms. But again, preserving the accuracy. Then we get effective, you know, all combined, we'll get the effective Z scale performance. Well, that said, uh, it's argumentative whether we can achieve this because uh, as much as the algorithms, if you look at the algorithms in the past, this is from uh, David Keyes and Thomas Schulte, some of the you know, papers uh, and some of the claims they have. Uh, it, it is true that the algorithmic advances have uh, provided super um, exponential, beyond the exponential speed up of the Moore's law. So, um, and these are, you know, uh, high order al high order methods, AMR and high order MR and, and blah, blah, blah. Now we have the data driven AI combined approaches. Uh, will al algorithms advances continue, continue to give us this 20X, 30X um, uh, speed up beyond the best numerical method we have now? That's something we don't know yet. So just as we have the end of Moore's law approaching with hardware, are we, do we still continue to have this um, continued speed up with the algorithmic improvements, or are we also reaching, you know, running out of ideas? That's something we don't know. Okay. Okay. So we go to myth four, which everything will run on some accelerator, and uh, myth 
which is associated with two, which everything will be deep learning. Um, so we wrote this paper, uh, uh, similar sets of authors, but a little different, uh, back in 2020, in which uh, we tried to look at uh, various uh, at real applications to see if they contain dense linear algebra operation. Now, a lot of people, if you ask, you know, for example, if I speak to Jim, Jim Ang, they say, well, you know, a lot of applications are bandwidth bound. Of course, Jim agrees. But do we have, so what percentage? We don't really know, right? Because we know, but you know, we, know, we, we know, sort of, we have a gut feeling it is so, but we really have to quantify this, okay? And, and this really defeats that, you know, the Limpact myth, right? So what we did was to look at um, many applications from ECP, uh, the Recans application for Fugaku, spec, um, of course, the top 500 benchmarks, you know, spec MPI, spec OMP, and also looked at some of the early uh, AI benchmarks. So we need to update the AI part um, because now the um, transformers have taken over, which is heavily matrix oriented. So transformers are, are really good. In fact, if you look at these figures on the right, um, you'll see that some of the early, um, even a, you know, like BERT, some of the early transformers do get significant speed up from the matrix engines. Um, oh, this is result from the B100. But other than that, um, we, we get very little, I mean, there's very little deep linear, uh, uh, no, dense linear algebra operations in any of these codes. So building uh, some system with very, like FP64 dense linear algebra matrix engine is total, is total stupidity. It's, you, don't, you don't need it. <clears throat> and this is not just you know, looking at you know, uh, superficial features of the code saying, no, we, oh, this is not calling BLAS, so we don't get no, dense linear algebra. No, this is really deep, going deep dive into every line of the code by using, utilizing our um, crowdsourcing student slaves and have them, you know, have them really look at the code to, to detect any sort of code patterns. Now, now, now these day, nowadays, maybe we can use AI to do this, but we use human intelligence for this paper and, crowd, and uh, uh, crowdsourcing to, to human detect any sort of dense linear algebra patterns. So, so, no, th so this result should be fairly bona fide. And again, by looking at that, um, the, the only, bench, only applic application that had extremely high occupancy of uh, FP64 dense linear algebra is obviously LIMPAC. Even, the, some of the, um, even some of the dense linear algebra rich, supposedly rich applications like molecular orbit, well, uh, like uh, density function DFT codes or any of them look at you know, shredding equation solvers, did not have occupancy beyond 40%. So, so what we did was also to take that data and also look at the, you know, and the mix, mixture of various application types within the various workloads then published for each of the machines at the time, like K or you know, LCF and so forth, and then try to see, okay, let's say we would have infinite speed up with the FP64 matrix engines, infinite, right? So how if we had so that means the runtime for the matrix operations will become zero. How much speed up would we get? Well, for the K computer, it was seven percent. Uh, for um, LCF, uh, uh, Blue Gene at the time was about ten percent. Now, of course, we have more machine language, uh, machine learning workloads, and maybe a little bit higher order methods. So we counted for that for future workloads and how much would it get? Well, about 30%. So is it worth the silicon invest well, investment? Or the other question to ask is, if we have invest a whole lot of money into having FD squared matrix engines, it makes very little sense. As that's where the speed up will come from. Okay. So where will the speed up come from? Well, obviously, I'm sorry for some of the Japanese here. I uh, had no time to translate this. But you, know, you, can, you can read this. This is, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, this is the obvious explanation with the roofline curve because uh, the obvious explanation is, of course, most applications are memory bound. 
So the only way to, to speed this, things up is to really elevate the, uh, the, the move line curve. The only method we know of doing that is to increase the memory bandwidth, right? And maybe the associated network bandwidth. So, uh, so we did some analysis as to how much uh, memory, uh, how much memory bandwidth we need to increase, and, and we do need to increase the memory bandwidth factor 10 to 20 for the future machines, and that's really hard. Okay, so, but then what are the, uh, but, but how do we build a machine like that? Well, so if you look at the, the various kernels, um, we don't, we're not building machines the right way. Because uh, typically, you know, some kernels may still be compute bound, okay, maybe low occupancy, but still some may use lower precision or maybe some higher order methods. Like I said, majority of the, of the applications are bandwidth bound. And we, what we didn't cover in the other paper were the, the latency bound applications, like the graph, like graphs, like graph applications. Or things like, you know, um, fairly uh, small size molecule but long trajectory molecular dynamics applications and things like that. So there are like several, there are several compute patterns we need to cover. The way had we, the classical vector machines back in the, up until the 90s, you know, 70s, 80s, the Cray ones, and up until the 90s. Um, the so-called supercomputers co covered mostly the bandwidth bound applications and some compute bound, but very narrow sets of applications. Then the commodity cluster days came because commodity processors, first risk processors, and x86 became very powerful, and the way to cover uh, this wide, wide, much wider spectrum of applications were to use uh, weak, weak scaling massive parallels. So each processor wasn't very powerful, but by parallelizing, it covered all three grounds. And that's how, you know, the 2000s, any, any machines like ASCII, whatever, or the, you know, the machine I built like Tsubame or Jaguar or the K computer were built upon this principle. Then the GPUs came about, like so Tsubame 2, ABCI Summit, this night, Frontier, Oh, sorry, it's misspelled Frontier. Um, so what GPUs did was to cover some of the grounds that CPU occupied because they had on a per chip basis superior uh, memory bandwidth and also actually superior compute uh, capability because of the graphics requirements. So this uh, labor were split up between the compute bound, bandwidth bound, mostly covered by GPUs, or the latency bound covered by CPUs. And uh, actually Fugaku X, A square fx was was sort of a CPU-based machine, but tried to kind of incorporate many of the vector features back from, the, from GPUs back onto the CPU. So, so it's a little bit di different design compared to the COTS-based CPU. We incorporate a lot of the vector features, so it has more commonality with the GPUs. But the point is this kind of, uh, which uh, compute kernel to co uh, will be covered by which chips can be different than just GPU-CPU combination. For example, CPUs, just like a square fx can be made to, you know, made with vector engines, but the matrix component can be embedded within some other chip, or maybe it can be an ex extended instruction set like Intel AMX, okay? Or it can be that the CPU would cover the bandwidth bound, but the strong scaling, um, latency bound and compute bound could be covered by one chip. There are some designs like that which I will not name due to NDA, but some companies are proposing to combine dense linear algebra and uh, latency bound applications by using data flow techniques. So the, there are different combinations. And um, so what we're doing is to try to see, um, you know, try to do some design studies of, of, of various types of processors and what kind of speed up we can expect. So uh, one design study we did was to design, try to design, uh, can we design a processor with 10 to 20 times the bandwidth and what would happen then? Okay, so this is, again, this is a paper we published recently, it's under review. Um, I won't go into too much in detail, just to give you a synopsis of the idea. So this was tested with um, uh, a, uh, AMD Milan chip where they have significantly higher L3 capacity. So when you look at the AMD literature, you'll find that this is what they publish on the left-hand side. They say, well, because of the enhanced L3, level three cache, 
they get like 20% to up to 60% speed up over existing applications. Actually, some applications you slow down. But if you dissect this carefully, and we, what we did was to do a more careful analysis of what, how the performance would, would, uh, would, be, would differ when we have a smaller uh, data set. Let's say we take uh, mini FE, mini finite element, and uh, the default size is 300 by 300 cubic, but what do we have with smaller data sizes? Well, obviously, uh, the performance increased because all the data will fit in the L3 cache. And um, in fact, at maximum, we get three times the performance of a default uh, had the data set have been in the RAM. And because it's 150 cubic, you need eight of those chips to, um, to arrive at the same data size, which may be achievable by scaling down to finer, uh, uh, to a finer mi micron rule, uh, finer lithography rules. So if we had abundant, uh, very fast memory, and we, had, uh, and we, we still maintain proportional the bandwidth per core, but able to access this through the L3 cache, then we achieve 24 times speed up. Okay, that's you know that's very simple math. So that's a how so so that's how, how we did the design study with our what we call a hypothetical processor called Lark, in which we try to scale down to scale down the lithography of uh, ACE core FX to future ACE core FX, and still maintain the same core design. But we shrink it, have many more cores, so there's no you know, design, big design challenge other than shrinking down, but have uh, you know, significantly stacked L2, uh, well, effectively uh, uh, SRAM layered on top. So we get about 24 terabytes per second memory bandwidth and about 36 teraflops, and about, actually the power consumption will be a little higher, about 500 watts. So all in all, we get about 10 times increase of bandwidth per, per watt um, over ACE core effects. And of course, we test it over various apps. I, I won't go into the details. Uh, some apps, we got significant, like 10 times speed up. Some apps, because they're compute bound or, or not, but overall, we get uh, a very good speed up. Okay, so that's good. But what about, um, um, uh, what about AI? Okay. So AI, uh, if we do the work on analysis of AI, and so uh, Shantanu Jha, one of my, our good friend Shantanu Jha had a paper uh, in which he tried to analyze the use of machine learning uh, in HPC codes, um, uh, coupled with HPC codes, because we know that in many cases, these um, will be combined in a single machine. First principle is simulation, empirical AI-based prediction, big data instrumentation, they need to come together. Okay. In fact, this is sort of an AI 5.0. It's AI, which we, I, I will term as AI for HPC. For the most part, it's been you know a lot of the you know chat, chat GPT, those type of works are they're fantastic, as we have discussed in the panel. Uh, but and um, you know they're changed, they're revolutionizing the way we work. But from the HPC's perspective, it's HPC for AI. Right? So most of the workload will be focused on training, you know, very large. Uh, neural network out of very large data sets. Whereas AI for HPC is AI for HPC, how AI will be working with or assisting the improvements of HPC, okay? So it's a very, little bit different. Uh, so, so it's a little different. In fact, I claim that a lot of new discoveries will be made with AI for HPC rather than HPC for AI, although both are very useful. And, but also they present very different types of a workload to the systems. So if you look at the, the cases um, of HPC AI for HPC, you find that the most cases ML use, machine learning use is inference, uh, like surrogates optimization. So compared to the main workload, which is simulation, the AI workload is minuscule. It's not to say that they're not important, they play a very important role, but in terms of the entire workload, right, how much occupancy has on CPU or GPU, it's minuscule compared to the simulation workload. Now, it could get more heavyweight when you start doing retraining of the network, training, uh, or doing things like training a deep learning neural network using uh, data synthesized and physics simulation. But still, the dominant workload is in the simulations. 
So, um, so in this type mode of operation, um, uh, some of the analysis we done show that um, the AI, the deep learning workload. Now, I'm, again, well, I'm not, we're not underestimating the importance of AI, but this is just to say, if we design machines, we break down the workload and the occupancy. In those terms, the AI workload will consume 10% or less of the entire machine. Okay, this is different from the training a chat GP uh, language model where majority of the workload will be training, okay? So if you want that type of workload, of course, that would be like almost 90%, 100% training, so you have to distinguish that. That said, um, scientific platforms may train on every data. Um, so if that comes true, then the um, AI workload may become a little bit more significant because we need to run to training continuously. However, you know, Again, we don't have good analysis. That we don't have good analysis of. So we need further work in the area, but to say that HPC will be taken over by AI workload will not, is, is a wrong perception. Still, the simulation workloads is a lot heavier compared to AI workloads, even in the case of this mixed usage. Okay, um, I think I'm running out of time, right? Okay, so one final word before I finish. Okay. Um, okay, fair enough. So, okay, extreme specialization. Okay, so okay, so let's say you know, for AI, we have, uh, and I, as I said, we categorize workloads, okay, we have these, well, what if we go more extreme and we have domain-specific accelerators and, and all that? Okay, so we build a very heterogeneous node in a way that we build smartphones. So smartphones, you know, smartphone chips have all these specialized functionalities. It's a collection of all these heterogeneous accelerators. And of course, that's there for a good reason. Now, however, we must point out that where do we get the source in HPC, where do we get the source of performance? And it's very different from a smartphone. A smartphone is mostly strong scaling. That is to say, we have workload, uh, you know, we speed up some function, okay? And this will, this, the, the limitations of the speed up will be always be bound by the Amdahl's law, okay? In HPC, most of the speed up comes from weak scaling, okay? And that's when we move to, as I alluded to in my, earlier in my talk, when we move to massive parallelism, the most, source, the most dominant source of a speed up is weak scaling. And that's been a sort you know, the, that's how the Gordon Bell Prize originated. Right? And that's how Gustafsson won, won the first Gordon Bell Award, and that's why this weak scaling law is typically referred to as a Gustafsson's law. Okay? So the point is how do they, they interact? In fact, if this extreme heterogeneity would, you know, if it, you know, if it kind of co coexists well with weak scaling, we get a combined effect. But if the this extreme heterogeneity compromises weak scaling, that's a bad news. So weak scaling, like I said, Fugaku got 160,000 nodes. Theoretically, we get 160,000 times speed up compared to a single chip. But in strong scaling, or Amdahl's law, we never get 160,000 times speed up, okay? So we should not get strong scaling compromise weak scaling. Okay, but how, how, do they inter how do they interact? So uh, again, we wrote a paper about this in Siam, two of us, uh, Jens Donk and myself. But here's a very small nutshell description. So on the, on the top, you see the Amdahl's law. So we all we know this, there's a non-accelerated portion. There's an accelerated portion. If you use an accelerator, this portion shrinks. Asymptotically, it goes shrinks down to zero. We get maximum speed up. Okay, that's Amdahl's law. Gustafsson's law is a uh, is a, little, a modification to this, in which but where we assume there is no shrinkage in time to solution, but rather we get parallelism. So the time to solution remains the same, but because we get parallelism, we get more compute. Okay, so we get performance increases because we increase the problem size, so we get better performance because of increased data size, data set size. So, so how do they combine? Well, so it combines like this. So um, the strong scaling part, 
it shrinks asymptotically, it, it will shrink to zero. Okay? So what it means will be the non-accelerated part. But as you can see, the accelerated part, because it shrinks, but it may, it may not shrink uniformly if we have heterogeneity. So in some cases, this may not help at all. So, so this means that if we get even a slightest load imbalance on the accelerated part, we, that kills performance. If even one of your node, because of heter extreme heterogeneity, performs 100 times slower, then your code runs 100 times slower. Okay? The only way to escape this is to have perfect load balancing, which is very hard since the accelerated portion is only like this big, only like this big, or you have totally, total independent parallelism where you have no synchronization. Okay? So in principle, these two things are very difficult to coexist. And that's why if you look at every successful, accel well, accelerate, well, you may not consider GPUs as accelerators anymore, but they're still heterogeneous in terms of combining CPUs and GPU. So if you look at every successful supercomputer out there with CPU and GPU combination, they have one, uh, they have two characteristics in common. One is that the nodes are uniform, uniformly architected. If you look at Frontier, same number of CPUs, same number of GPUs, same time CPU, same time GPU. Same with Savami, same, same with Pistain, same with Lumi, same with Aurora. And that makes, that makes it very easy, that makes it a lot easier to load balance, okay? And to weak scale. Also, if you look at the codes, they are either dominantly running on the CPU or dominantly running on the GPU. You don't have a mixture where on one node it's running predominantly a CPU, and on the other node you're running predominantly on GPU. You don't have that because, again, that kills load balancing. So, again, you want, so you stick to processing on one of the processors and you try to load balance that by having uniform workload, by having uniform data partitioning which is a classic HPC way of achieving load balance. That's exactly why successful machines are homogeneously architected, despite being heterogeneous within a node. So this concept of, of extreme heterogeneity, I wouldn't say it's impossible to pull off, but very difficult to weak scale in practice. In fact, it'll kill the benefits of weak scaling on these large systems. So it may work for a small system, but for a large system, it will not work, okay? So with all these principles, we are designing our next generation machine, hopefully to be deployed in 2030. Um, there are lots of other things we're doing. And um, yeah, but hopefully we can, yeah, uh, which I can, we cannot tell you yet, um, but hopefully uh, we can uh, we're currently under the feasibility study phase, uh, 2023. Uh, but hopefully in, in a couple of years, we'll be able to launch the, 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 the next phase of the project, which will be uh, the next uh, preliminary design. Then on to the real machine in 2029. So I will not be able to retire by then. <laughs> I'm not saying job security. You know, they won't let me retire. <laughs> Yeah, so with that, um, so here are some of the ideas. Okay, with, but um, I'll end my talk here. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>